Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things maker and embedded and lovely. Now, uh, the attic of dreams is still very much in disarray. There is packing paper, boxes, everything that you would expect with a studio that is being rebuilt from the ground up, more or less. So uh, this show will be another one which is a little bit different to our normal show, but I hope you won't notice too much of a difference. All of the regular sections will be there, like funding website things, and of course, the mystery box competition, and many, many more. So let's get going. And we are going to start this week with funding website things. And as you can see, we're here on CrowdSupply with the Hackboard 2. Now, I mentioned the Hackboard 2 uh, previously uh, before it had launched. And this is actually quite an interesting thing in and of itself. Um, there's a bit of a story behind this. But before we go into that, um, let's just talk about what it is. So, um, yeah, they have a video explaining what it is, but in, very briefly, this is an x86 SBC, um, which, as you can see from the title, uh, is capable of running Windows 10. Now, you can also run x86 Linux distributions on this too, and it has optional 4G or 5G connectivity. Um, and I remember saying at the time that this uh, was quite an interesting board and there was a few things about it that would, you know, decide whether it was really exciting or not. And one of them would be the price. And I think that now that we see what the price is, this is actually quite an interesting little thing. Because as you can see, you can get the Hackboard 2 with Windows 10 Pro for $140, or you can get a version with Ubuntu Linux for $99. And of course, the price difference there is just that you're getting a version of Windows 10 Pro um, already authorized on the board when it arrives to you. So as you can see here, one of the things that they are absolutely wanting you to see is that this board will run Windows 10, and that is thanks to the dual-core Intel Celeron chip that it has on the board. Now, there's something quite interesting here, which is I'm not sure. Oh, no, I, I, it says right here. This is Hackboard 1 shown in all the photos. The Hackboard 2 is actually slightly different. Um, and uh, there's a number, a number of reasons uh, why this could be. Um, I've done a little bit of research, and from what I can find, that the original Hackboard just never came to be. Um, whether they had issues with it that they just decided to iterate straight onto the next level, or whether there was something more involved, I do not know. Um, but regardless of that, this does look like it's going to be quite an exciting little thing, because as you can see, you have your three USB 3.1 ports here. It has, as it says, the capability of 4G or 5G. That's something that you will get um, with an NVMe module that you can buy optionally with the board. They also sell them here, as you can see, uh, $50 for a 4G cellular modem uh, NVMe module and $299 for the 5G one. Obviously a big jump there, but that's because you're paying for the 5 g -ness. Um 5 g -ness? That's a, a new phrase for the show and one that I think will stick. So the features and specifications are here, and I would go through all of them because this does look like a great little board, but instead I'm going to do what I love doing and referring you to someone else. And that is the always excellent ETA Prime. It's been a while since we've had an excuse to, uh, to show a little bit of an ETA Prime video on the show, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, I think he is one of the best people for unboxing and explaining how to do things with single board computers and anything you would want to know about retro gaming. Now, um, as I mentioned before, the Hackboard 1 uh, it never came to light. And what he has here is a Hackboard 1. Um, so they do exist, they just never went on sale. And there are a few notable differences, many of which he goes into in the video. Um, but the main ones that I will mention is that the chip on the Hackboard 1 is uh, not quite as impressive as the chip on the Hackboard 2. This is something that ETA Prime goes into great detail in in the video. And a, a real notable difference is the fact that there is a micro SD slot on this particular board he is holding here, which is not on the Hackboard M2. They decided to put another NVMe slot slot on the board, which I'm not particularly unhappy about, because this board also comes with a fair chunk of onboard eMMC storage for flashing your OS onto and using as well. Storage. And as mentioned, yes, the onboard eMMC flash is 64 gigabytes, which is a fair chunk for a nice little single board computer. Although, of course, a Windows 10 uh, installation will take up a fair chunk of that because Windows does like to take up a lot of stuff. Um, but the thing that I think is the most exciting thing about this for makers and hackers and people that enjoy the show is the fact that this is a small single board computer, slightly larger than a Raspberry Pi. As you can see here, I decided to quickly flick through to this, slightly larger than a Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, but it is a x86 single board computer with GPIO pins, and I have talked at great length about how exciting I find that prospect. So um, just a, a quick image here of uh, the ports, but again, this is the Hackboard 1, but I believe that the Hackboard 2 has these same ports. It is only the micro SD card that has changed along with the CPU. There may be a couple of other small changes, but they seem to be the major changes between the Hackboard 1 that will never be and the Hackboard 2 that is now available on CrowdSupply. 
So yes, this is a board that I think has a lot of potential. It's certainly one that I will be interested in looking into in the new year. I might try and get my hands on one. As well as the bare board that you can get with Windows 10 or Ubuntu on it, um, there is uh, kit versions of it. So uh, here you see a kit with a webcam and a small uh, keyboard and mouse setup, along with a quite nice looking little case. Um, I, I'm quite a fan of this. It's quite a nice little design. Properly injection molded ABS, uh, not your uh, average 3D printed case that comes with it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, as, as much as I understand why some people think uh, they don't make much sense, I quite like these open-sided cases. Um, they should give enough protection for most uses, unless you're going to use this in your wood cutting workshop, and you probably want to get something a little bit more enclosed in that case. And the other uh, Hackboard 2 kit they're selling is the Hackboard 2 Complete Kit, which has the Hackboard um, along with uh, this uh, HDMI monitor. Um, I'm just wondering if it is a touchscreen. I don't think it is. No, it is an HD monitor with integrated speakers, USB-C and HDMI inputs. Uh, oh, cool. Okay, that's, that's kind of nice. And of course, the same webcam and keyboard and mouse setup that comes with the other ones. So, um, as you're seeing here, the Hackboard 2 is already doing pretty well. They've made $56,000 out of their $1 goal. This is another one that just had a nominal sort of $1 thing. They just wanted to get it out there so people could see it was being made and you can support it if you want. All in all, this appears to be a pretty good value single ball computer, which is usable in many, many ways. Um, as it says here, it's one of the things that uh, we kind of good for entertainment systems. Um, and uh, yes, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, ETA Prime will give you a lot of options for what you can do with it as well. Um, one of the things I do know um, from doing a little bit of research is whether you get the Ubuntu Linux version or the Windows 10 version, there are drivers in place for using these GPIO pins that were flying past us on the screen uh, using Python. So yes, I uh, suggest you go and check out Hackboard 2 on CrowdSupply and uh, uh, get one while you can. Um, I do know that the Linux version is only available from CrowdSupply. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you want to get it with Linux, uh, go there and check the always excellent, oh, uh, ad. <laughs> The always excellent uh, ETA Prime video, which currently is uh, just showing me adverts because, as always, I'm doing this in incognito mode. Moving over to Kickstarter with the Pi OT2 Precision series. Now, uh, this is quite an exciting little hat for the Raspberry Pi. Um, there are a few of them out there, but this is a, a digitally compliant uh, industrial uh, use hat for the Pi, um, which as you just saw flew past on the screen, um, uh, allows up to 24 volt input, uh, 50 volt to up to 500 milliamp output, I believe, um, with some precision analog sensors and a few other goodies. And yes, as you can see here, you have the RS-485 serial port and Ethernet access as well. Now, there are a couple of versions of this. The precision version of it is the only one that has the 24 volt inputs. Um, there's another version of it which is slightly different, uh, but they're both limited as uh, both listed as things that you can get from the Kickstarter page over here. Um, they uh, have another thing here I think is fantastic. Um, this is an uninterruptible power supply, which reminds me a little bit of a project we showed on the week, uh, the show a few weeks ago, which was that capacitor-based thing for um, your Pi Zero, which would give you a little bit of time in a power out uh, to detect the power out and shut your Pi down. Uh, this is a little bit more robust than that. As you can see, this takes two batteries and works with it to give you a little bit more time um, uh, if the power does go out. And again, will send a shutdown signal via when the power is lost. Now, um, as you can see from this image here, um, when you actually have the Pi inside it, um, you get a, a, an idea of how chunky this thing is. Um, they're really pushing this idea that this is something that is up to industrial standards, and it is compliant with industrial standards. And uh, also because of that, there are a lot of uh, bits of information in this, which will probably be very interesting to you if you are someone who has worked with embedded hardware in the industry before, or are very interested in the specifics of the electrics that work with it. Um, but for people like us, um, I have always kind of been kind of interested interested in ways of integrating the cheaper and more simple microcontrollers and single board computers I have with industrial hardware, despite the fact that I have no real reason to do so. It's just another one of those things that uh, kind of sticks in your mind. Um, part of the little imposter syndrome I have, which leads me to try and do bare metal programming and try and learn the industrial side of things, despite the fact I probably don't need to do either of those things. So, um, as I said, there are various different reward levels for the Pi OT2, and this chart shows them rather well. The Pi OT2 uh, is still a quite impressive little thing. Um, it, it has Ethernet access along with integrated mounts and fans, six digital outputs, eight analog inputs, um, and it was uh, powered by five volts. And then um, as you step up, you get the Pi uh, OT2 Plus, which has that uninterruptible power supply, um, and then the Pi OT2 Precision, which has uh, anything from 12 to 24 volt input, um, the UPS, and the RS-485 serial port att uh, uh, attachment. 
Um, and yeah, I, I, the thing that I find the most exciting out of all of these is the fact that you can have up to four 24 volt digital inputs, meaning that you have a massive range of uh, input voltages that you can work with without frying your pie. Um, and while, again, I have no equipment that puts out those kind of voltages, I do wonder whether um, if I do, well, I say if, when I do start collecting random bits of test equipment from the past to play with them, I'm going to run into situations where I will need to read higher voltages without frying my equipment and whether something like this could be useful for that job. Anyhow, the Kickstarter page has all of the information you would need if this is something that does appeal to you, and um, the price itself also seems to be rather reasonable as well. As it says here, you have the uh, Precision Series for $159, US, which has the Precision Series along with the uninterruptible power supply. Now, you might think this is quite a lot for a hat um, for your Raspberry Pi, or, well, I say hat, I mean, this is more like a... A uh, little snug case for your Raspberry Pi, really. Um, for what it can actually do, I think this is amazing. Uh, there's a lot of hacks and ways that you can roll up something like this yourself, but if you want something that seems to be very well put uh, together and very well thought out by people who have worked with this kind of stuff for some time, this looks like a good option. So yes, Pi OT2 in various types. Um, I will leave a link to this Kickstarter in the description, along with a link to the Crowd Supply for Hackboard 2 in the description of the video as well. I hope you find one of these two things interesting. It's the mystery box competition! Actually, this is a mystery one-use barbecue, but the mystery box is under a lot of other boxes, so uh, I can't actually lift it up and show you it at the minute. Uh, worst competition ever, am I right? Yes. So um, I, I'm going to reach into the mystery box, which is... I've shoved other boxes aside to get an arm in there, and I'll be able to pick out a prize for you, so I'll be, I'll be, I'll be right back. Okay, so we have a box, but what is in the box? It is MP Lab Express IDE? What? Oh, okay, sorry, this is a microchip evaluation board for MP Lab Express cloud-based IDE, but what is it? What, what is the board? What, look in the box, Ian. Why, why are you looking at, the, looking at the box when you could look in the box? Oh, okay, that's, this, is, this is actually... Okay, the box has more answers. This is actually kind of cool. So, this is the, this is the microcontroller itself. I'll, I'll come on to that in just a second. But in the box, it tells you it has... Can I, can I show you this particularly easily? I mean, you won't be able to read it, but this is quite a nice little guide to the board, which is uh, here, which we'll come on to in a second. And it has a 28-pin uh, PIC 16F18858 bit microcontroller. I believe this is the first PIC microcontroller we've ever given away on the show. Um, I, as I've talked about in the past, when we've talked about them just uh, uh, over there, I don't, I'm not as familiar with PIC, although I am uh, a little bit familiar with certain uh, chips from microchip, although, as I have said before, they make everything. So, of course I would be. Um, so, pre-wired LEDs, push-button switch and potentiometer enable quick prototyping, access to MCU pills or pins are available via breakout headers for easy expansion. And um, I believe that these, uh, this particular expansion uh, set of headers uh, that you can hopefully see there, if my camera is focusing, are compatible with all of the micro bus things that micro, uh, microchip sell. And there are a lot of them. And I mean, as I'm sure you've already kind of made the connection, this is your Arduino shields, but for this particular setup, you can get um, headers that do almost everything or shields or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, this is a cool little board. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the uh, browser-based IDE that they use um, is actually pretty fully featured. Um, I, as I say, I haven't messed around with the chip directly, but I've messed around with a handful of browser IDEs to write about them in the past. And this uh, does certainly look like a fun little 8-bit microcontroller. Uh, anyway, uh, distractions, I'm looking at it instead of picking a prize winner, which I will go and do now. And your winner this week is Cyberman471. And in terms of Cybermen, to only be the 471st Cyberman means you're pretty young, actually. That's, uh, that's a young Cyberman right there, uh, who will be winning this uh, PIC microcontroller evaluation board uh, with a comment that said, hey, I'm in the video. Uh, are you? Are you in the video? Unless you are... Um Hang on, hang on, hang on. The Connect Laser, was, you were the Connect Laser Dot person. I had forgotten your username. Um, yes, if you remember in the last week's show, I showed a delightful video of someone who was way too excited about having a Connect and a laser pointer, but there's no such thing as being too excited about a project like that. It was super cool. And if there is you, I'm very glad this little thing is on its way to you. I hope you get a lot of fun out of it. It is a very nice alternative to your other 8-bit microcontrollers you may have played with. And if you do end up making something awesome with it, please do share it back with us. We might end up putting it back on the show again. Anyway, we'll be in touch as to how we can send this to you. Um, I think we should probably get on with the rest of the show now, don't you? And now we're going to take a look at a few of the cool uh, projects and things that have turned up on the internet this week that I thought were maybe worth having a look at. And we're starting on the interesting as... Well, it's an interesting subreddit, um, and uh, this is a matrix effect using LiDAR, Unity, and ARKit. And this is the LiDAR that you find on all of the more recent uh, iPhones. 
Now I'm aware it's a vertical video and it is on the side of the screen and that is not ideal, but if you try and ignore that, you will see that this is a real time uh, AR using the LiDAR on the iPhone 12, I believe. And this blows my mind that this is being done in real time. Now, I've um, not directly done many project, projects like this myself. I've tried to help people out where I can um, with things like using Unity uh, to you know, uh, actually produce things to put into an AR world. But the, the actual code base of it and the SDK is something I do not understand. But yeah, this is real time. Um, sending out uh, the, uh, sorry, judging distance using the LiDAR. And as you can see, these matrix letters were being occluded by the other person. Uh, so the LiDAR was detecting the other person. It's also detecting this gateway over here that they have made and are walking through. And when you go through this gateway, it stops. This is incredible. Now, as always, you can dive into the Reddit thread, which I will link, um, but because uh, it is important to give credit where it is due, uh, down in this Reddit thread, there is a link to Oliver G Gogel, I pronounced that wonderfully, um, and a linked in post showing uh, what, uh, yeah, this is the same video, it's just uh, showing what it is. Uh, this is a, a CTO at Hollowforge Interactive, so someone I uh, am fairly sure knows what they are doing. But yes, while there isn't a huge amount of information on this, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the AR kit uh, works with Unity, and uh, while I am very familiar with the Unity game engine, Unity, Unity 3D, I don't really know all that much about AR kit. There are a lot of great tutorial videos out there on the subject, though I just haven't really dived in. And then yes, having fun with li uh, the LiDAR, which is the uh, the sensor that you will find on your iPhones. I just saw this video and it completely blew my mind, and it makes absolute sense that it's on the interesting as, uh, well, it's an interesting subreddit, isn't it? Moving on to the Raspberry Pi subreddit and RoboScan, which is a Raspberry Pi based automated analog film scanner. Yes, we're going right from the LiDAR of the future on iPhones right back to analog film. Um, and I would show you the video here, but um, having another Reddit video won't work for me day. But luckily there is also a YouTube video, which we will move on to in a moment. But the maker Benj Bez, also known as uh, Benjamin Bezin, uh, has said this is a largely updated version of a scanner of film rolls using a Raspberry Pi and Lego bricks built as a lockdown project. Now there's so many things in there I love already. Using a Raspberry Pi of course, very much part of this show, and using Lego in builds is something that I'm a big fan of as well. And uh, yeah, as it says, this is largely uh, an updated version of something that they have made already. Um, there's a, a little update on uh, all of the different uh, things that have changed here, uh, using a web interface to scan the pro uh, to control the scanning process, along with a bunch of other things I will let you read for yourself. Um, but yes, when you see it on video, you will also understand the other side of this, which I know is a silly thing, but I just love the way it looks. I love this little Lego thing that is attached to a Raspberry Pi, and it is obviously, as you can obviously see, um, there is a light and uh, a sensor for scanning them. Um, there's also interestingly under here uh, a Coral uh, Edge uh, USB accelerator unit. Now I wonder what he's using that for. And you see it was right in front of my face and I didn't even read it properly. Machine learning to detect when a photo is correctly framed. High performance inference on a Google Coral TPU. Yes this is a super interesting and super uh, high level project. So back to looking at it because it is so beautiful. Um, as you can see, uh, the idea of actually f scanning film isn't all that complicated in and of itself. Um, but doing it well and in an automated fashion is is actually uh, a little bit more. Ah, look, this is the thing. Sorry, distraction. Uh, a little bit more involved is what I was going to say, and this is what it is doing. It is automating, making sure that the film is in the right place for scanning. Now, um, there is a, a little thing here of the GUI that he has made as well, um, which is, uh, able, where you're able to choose the film that you're using and all of that kind of stuff. Um, there is so much to this project, which is, by the way, completely open source. There is a GitHub, which is also linked on the Reddit thread, which takes you through all of it, um, how to install it, how to deploy it in Docker, and then how to use it. And as you can see as well, um, it integrates directly into Capture One. So this is uh, using rsync, though it doesn't even touch the SD card of the Raspberry Pi. It just goes directly uh, to your program you can use for editing the uh, negatives. Um, yeah, this is this is just a <laughs> this is an incredible project. This is uh, one of the cooler lockdown projects I've seen. Um, I know there are uh, less and less people out there using analog film these days. Uh, what with the proliferation of fantastic DSLRs, but there is a huge amount of film in general just sitting in people's garages and sitting in people's houses. Negatives of photos that were taken by relatives or friends over years, and it is uh, yeah it's just incredible that there is an easy way to now. Well, <laughs> I say easy. There is a way to now automate taking that film. 
Anyway, as always, reading this for yourself will give you a far better idea of the project than I can give you in the short time I can talk about it on the show. Um, but yes, uh, this is uh, definitely among one of the cooler projects that's happened during lockdown, and anything that's made with LEGO but with this level of complexity gets a massive thumbs up from me. I'll leave a link to the Reddit thread in the description, and from there you can jump straight to both the YouTube video and the GitHub that I showed just now. Now moving on to a project I was sent by someone else this week, which is how to build an Alexa speaker with Raspberry Pi. And this is a tutorial that was uh, published on Tom's Hardware, and it is a tutorial written by Caroline Dunn. Um, now, just quickly, uh, the tutorial itself is exactly what it says on the tin. You use a speaker, you use a Raspberry Pi and a microphone, and then you can make your own Alexa speaker by using the Alexa SDK and installing it on the Pi. And um, I actually, some years ago, wrote a parallel tutorial to this. I wrote a tutorial for a, a different site long before the Electromaker show ever came into being on how to do exactly this, but using the Google Assistant uh, API, or SDK, sorry, on the Raspberry Pi. So this project really does appeal to me. Now, the project itself uh, takes you through a few things like, um, you know, why build it when you could buy it? What's the difference between Alexa Pi and Echo devices? Um, but then the important thing is it takes you step by step through how to actually install it on your Raspberry Pi, how to set up the hardware and how to get it all going, um, how to get yourself an Amazon developer account um, and everything that you need to get going. And these kind of text step by step guides are really valuable. Um, I do love video tutorials. And in fact, if I had to write the tutorial I'd, or do a video, I'd probably choose a video because I can waffle. Um, but yeah, concise, well-made tutorials like this are an absolute resource. And of course, I will link this in the description. But as I mentioned, this is Caroline Dunn, and this is someone who I'm very familiar with because I've been a subscriber of her YouTube channel for quite some time. And yeah, her channel is just the probably most complete channel I've come across um, when it comes to uh, how to use Alexa with Pi and various other smart home hacks and how to set up things in smart home uh, in your DIY smart home versus products and yeah I don't know it's just a fantastic tech channel that is always always active um, and uh, rather than go to one particular video um, I will just link her channel in the description um, I'm sure it will also be linked somewhere in this tutorial article as well um, but if you are interested in uh, yeah uh, DIY smart home stuff, uh, Caroline Dunn, I think, is one of the uh, underappreciated channels on YouTube for it. I mean, with 26,000 subscribers, she's not exactly doing badly, but I do think more people should know about this channel. So go and check it out. Now, after last week's video with uh, Charis Cat making a multiplexed input system for Arduino that she uh, put into Max, and that's going to be a fantastic machine learning synthesizer, as I said, we'll definitely be coming back to that one. I got a bit interested in looking into multiplexing again. So I thought I'd just look up a few videos, and this is by no means a new video. This is from April 18th, 2016. But uh, I just think it's a very concise and lovely introduction to multiplexing, uh, step by step how to go through it all. Um, uh, there's no uh, A, B as to which is better between this and Charis Cat's video. Video. They're two different styles of videos, um, and I do think it's always worth looking at a few different people teaching you something in order to get a better understanding of it. And this is what you can see on the screen. This is using eight buttons and eight LEDs to work with input and output using a multiplexer, only using two pins of the Arduino Nano you can see on the screen. And this video, by the way, comes from Harry Wiguna, who's a YouTuber that I was not familiar with until now. Um, I have since subscribed to his channel and looked through. There are some fantastic videos on the channel. It hasn't been as active recently, but from what I understand, he's just very busy with IRL stuff. So it's still worth uh, having as a subscription for when he gets back to making videos, which he has said he will be doing soon. But yes, there's not much more to say about this video other than um, it shows you the hardware of how you can do all this kind of stuff. A fantastic explanation of what is going on in terms of how you get input and output, how you can pull uh, the circuitry high and low and how that makes the lights go on and makes the buttons be red and things not getting confused on the Arduino along with very very well uh, explained uh, code which talks about uh, what they used in order to um, get this thing working essentially so you do use the wire library you know the i2c library for Arduino but um, the, not much of this is uh, obfuscated is that the word I was looking for I hope it was um, this explains uh, every bit that is being written um, and exactly how it works and exactly how it has been customized to make that quite nice pattern you saw at the beginning of the video. So yes, a simple and uh, well-explained multiplexing tutorial. Two in two weeks. What can I say? I get a little bit obsessed with things. And while we're talking about people who are very good at explaining things in a simple way that even people like me can understand, uh, Great Scott is someone that we've had on the show before and that I've been a great fan of for many years. And this video is talking about MOSFETs. It's actually a sort of follow-up video to a video he did some time ago explaining MOSFETs, which goes into a bit more detail as to why you would sometimes want to use a MOSFET driver. Now, this is just part one of a series um, where he uh, explains 
exactly how MOSFETs work in great detail in a way that I hadn't really actually looked into before. Um, MOSFETs are one of those nice black box units where I've always just assumed that for my use cases, I don't need to think about it all that much. And if I've had any doubt as to what I'm doing, I've uh, smacked a big heat sink on the MOSFET so that things don't go horrible. Um, but I never really quite understood in this much depth. Uh, how MOSFETs work and the considerations uh, you should have before using one and how to use it. And as you can see, I'm not the only one who uh, was interested in this. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, I, I won't go into it in any more details than that. If you use MOSFETs, you should watch this video unless you already know everything there is to know about them. Um, Great Scott has a fantastic way of teaching um, and a very, very pleasant way of uh, annotating what he is doing. Uh, so yeah, uh, go to the Great Scott channel. Um, I'm fairly sure if you're watching this, you'll already be a subscriber of his. Uh, he has an absolute wealth of fantastic different projects, videos, and explainers for anyone interested in maker DIY electronics. And we're going to finish out this week's show with just a couple of updates. Uh, one is a software update and the other is a new single board computer. So as you can see, the uh, Arduino command line tool is out uh, and ready for the public. Now, when I say out, I mean the latest alpha edition is out. This is 0.14. This is still very early days. But I mentioned this when it first came out because it's something I find somewhat compelling. As I talk about a lot, I am very interested in command line coding and very bare metal and bottom side of things. But I also like using the Arduino IDE and platform.io for quick prototyping. Um, and if I'm being absolutely honest, there's nothing that I do on the command line and bare bones that I need to do. I could do everything using the Arduino IDE. Now, this is a nice step between the two things. And as you can see here, there's a little bit of sort of example uh, commands, as it were. Um, you can uh, uh, configure init the destination drive and write a config, uh, config file uh, to your folder. And then the config file uh, has the different board manager stuff and everything that you would find uh, in the preferences on the Arduino IDE. So I'll just go over a couple of the highlights they've mentioned for the latest release. Um, there is a full changelog available linked from this blog post and also an upgrade guide to upgrade from the original alpha version. Um, but yes, flags to install libraries from a local zip file or git URL, which is a much more familiar way of doing it from the command line if you are already working on the command line. Added a clean flag for the compile command, which again, if you are someone who has worked on the command line with make files, um, having a clean command is very nice because it gets rid of uh, pre-production uh, outputs when you're just testing something so you don't, uh, don't get buried in object files and bins and all that kind of stuff. Added a dest file flag to the config init command, which just means you can config but in a different destination to where you are now. Uh, better tracking of installed platforms, a few useful UX improvements and a bunch of bug fixes. And yes, as I previously mentioned, there is a full changelog here, uh, which is just the, well, changelog, um, but a very, very detailed upgrade uh, guide here, which goes through pretty much everything that has changed and what it might mean for you and how you must uh, use the uh, uh, command line tool from now on. Um, this is something that I hope I get a little bit of time over Christmas to play with, actually, um, because, uh, again, um, one foot in both worlds, being able to use very familiar Arduino code and not have to really think too much um, about the bare metal side of things is nice, but I am a big fan of messing around on my command line. Um, in fact, uh, I am a little bit sad that we're back in Windows 10 for this week's show. I really enjoyed having a Linux show. Maybe uh, one day we'll have some kind of mad bare bones arch Linux based show where uh, nothing works because I forget all of my keyboard commands. Anyhow, there'll be a link to this in the description of the video and from here you can easily get to both of these other pages as well. And finally this week, a new Banana Pi board. Now, as you well know, Banana Pi have been making uh, Raspberry Pi clone boards for a very, very long time. And they usually offer something like maybe it is cheaper than the Raspberry Pi or something like that. This time round, they've done something a little bit different, which is this is a Raspberry Pi SBC with four gigabytes of RAM, uh, which is $53. And it has a relatively comparable chip to a uh, CPU chip to the Raspberry Pi 4. But what it also has is 16 gigabytes of eMMC flash on board. And to me, that's the real draw here because Banana Pi boards are great, but they historically don't have quite the same level of support as of the Raspberry Pi. I mean, obviously, you have Raspbian OS, which is one of the best supported SBC OSs out there. Banana Pi haven't necessarily been quite as up there, and you had have had to have a little bit of uh, prior knowledge in order to get things running smoothly. Um, but for them, selling a board which is an analog to the Raspberry Pi 4 gigabyte version, but with 16 gigabytes of eMMC on board for $53, which is a very similar price, is actually kind of amazing. 
However, as the fantastic article on CNX Software points out, it does have a competitor in the Odroid C4. And there is a handy table here showing the differences between them. Uh, again, I could go into great detail here and talk about what makes it good, what makes it bad, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, but a couple of the notable things is the Odroid C4 has a flash module socket, whereas the Banana Pi has the flash uh, module already on board. But there are a few other differences, like you can get a much wider input uh, voltage range on the Odroid, which if you're using a lot of powered things from your GPIO pins, might be something that you you want to keep in mind and of course there is the uh, Raspberry Pi side of things as well I mean you're missing out on both the MIPI and DC uh, display and camera ports um, MIPI and DC did I just say <laughs> MIPI DSI and MIPI CSI camera ports dearie me I might not have the camera on but I still can't speak um, and uh, yeah, this uh, again, this is something where I think this is compelling. If there's a reason why you would want a board with onboard storage for cheap, you're not going to get anything much cheaper than this right now. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, support for both Android and uh, Linux on this. Um, but as uh, with a lot of single board computers, what I am not sure of is whether this is native Android support. Um, you still might have to play around to get it working up to an extent. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention it. There is a new Banana Pi M5 uh, single board computer out which comes with 16 gigabytes of eMMC flash and it is only $53, which is a bit of a bargain. That was our show. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, the next few shows will probably be quite similar to this. I am really looking forward to getting the new studio set up, but as anyone out there who has also bought one of the new RTX uh, video cards knows, uh, where are they? Uh, I own one, but nobody can tell me where it is. So as soon as that's all set up, uh, there'll be fancy new, uh, probably a studio tour, but for now, uh, I hope you're having a wonderful time towards the end of this, the weirdest of years. Take care.